Hello, everybody. My name is Kang Sok Byun, and I'm from Korea. And hello, everybody. My name is Marilyn Plumley, and I'm here in Kazakhstan. Our talk today is called From Oblivion to Host to the World in 20 Years, Korean Sign Language and its Speakers. So we have several important points that we're going to cover today. First of all, we're going to talk about the beginnings of the Korean sign language story. We're going to talk about all of the factors that influence the development of Korean sign language in the Korean deaf community. And then we're going to look and see what is coming up in the future, the perspectives for the future, the hopes and aspirations for the future. So, you know, I just, I just said, we have a story, a historical story to present. One of the important parts of that is the randomness of the people who encountered each other. And we, each of these encounters created another seed. We planted new seeds for the development of the Korean sign language research and the Korean deaf community. And each of these relationships contributed a different component, a different element to our development. In fact, what we're saying is that the relationships are the drivers of the evolution of our story. You see this timeline here. Um, there are several important points. And the point is before 1999, there were people who were working on sign language, but there were no real relationships. There were a couple of hearing people who were doing research and who were giving lectures. They even printed and published things, but there was no real relationship with the deaf community. But from 1999, things began to develop. They set up a sign language interpreting center. And then there were universities which set up training programs for sign language interpreting. And in, 19, in 2006, the government decided to establish a certification program for interpreters. And that was really important. And, you know, the thing is then, in 2007, this is a very important year because uh, the deaf became very, very visible. And we wanted to have full interpreting on the television, full interpreting or sign language or captioning. You see those pictures down below? This is showing you how we protest in Korea. A television, we throw it away because what's use the television if we can't have captions? We demanded more services. We were really, really protesting. And then the other one was about driver's license. We had a driver's license to drive small cars, but deaf people were not allowed to drive larger vehicles like nine passenger vehicles. So that was the beginning of a really, really strong, strong protest. And myself, I started getting involved in that. And um, when the deaf were, were protesting and trying to get all of these, um, all of this was building up since the, two, the early 2000s. And um, the president of the Korean Deaf Association uh, is my father, in fact, and he influenced me. He influenced me. Uh, I began university in 2000, the year 2000. And during that period, I was strongly influenced by my father and his political sense. But I didn't really realize the importance of language, of language, the sign language as a part of our identity. But as a university student, I was already involved because we needed these interpreting services. And now I want to talk about what happened personally. Then I met Marilyn in 2002, and we started talking about linguistics 
And uh, she, I was telling her about our political struggles and she said, you know, but the linguistic, the knowledge of your, your sign language and the linguistic knowledge is really important. So that's when I began to study and learn and learn about linguistics. And then very important year in 2004, I went to MPI, the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics. And then I developed many, 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 many uh, more relationships which we're going to be talking about. So, that whole period was a very, very influential period. And it shows the relationship between the deaf community and the linguistic knowledge that we can bring to our protests. So as I was mentioning on the timeline in 2002 is when I first met Marilyn. But actually before that, before that I had met this person in 1999, I met Hong Song Un who was in Germany. Her parents are from Korea. And uh, she was researching, she was doing a research on Korean sign language. And she contacted me in Korea to give data for her master's thesis, for her research. So that was my really first time to be in touch with a linguist. I said, well, that's interesting. That was pretty interesting. And then later, a few years later, then I met Marilyn and I met another linguist. And I said, you know, uh, actually from that point on is when I really got involved in linguistics. And uh, we went to the deaf way and I saw the different uh, deaf people from all these different cultures. And then when we came back to Korea, um, we decided, Marilyn and I and uh, this other friend, Kim Se Kyung, who had been studying in America, she was doing her PhD in linguistics. And so all the three of us got together and uh, we decided to make a Korean sign language uh, research group. And we would get together every week. And that's where I began to develop my knowledge. Before that, I really knew nothing about uh, linguistics or Korean sign language as a link from a linguistic perspective. So then things were going on. So then in, in 2002, 2003, and I was still learning a lot. I was still uh, learning a lot about sign language and about sign language linguistics. And there is this woman in, who was in Europe, Ulrike Zeshan, and she was working at the Max Planck Institute. And she was looking for deaf researchers to join her project on typology. She was researching on typology of different languages. And she was looking for a Korean or someone from another language that she hadn't been working on. And Marilyn said that, uh, heard about that. And she proposed me and Ulrika accepted me and hired me to work in her project. So in 2004, I flew to the Netherlands. I met uh, a, a Turkish, uh, deaf person a, a from India, someone from India, from Germany, from Russia, all these different countries. We began to develop all these relations. All of us were working together with Ulrika on that project. And uh, that's where I then began developing as a linguist, working together under the direction there at the Max Planck Institute. And so now we're gonna continue the next stage. So I had been working there at the MPI and then I came back to Korea and I was looking around to see what was going on in the deaf community. And I said, I think that I need to stay here in Korea and I'm going to do my further research on linguistics there in Korea. And so that was, I started doing um, my MA in 2008. And then I went to SIL, the Summer Institute of Linguistics in America. And um, then, then I went, I started my PhD in 2014. And in the meantime, I worked on, I did publications, I gave talks in various places around the world at different uh, sign language research uh, conferences. And I've gone, I began teaching. Yeah, and I've been teaching at different universities in Korea, sign language and interpreting and different, uh, different components of linguistics about research. So you can see all these different things. 
yeah, the KNUW uh, is one of the new universities. And then I started a company called Dandelion, which is uh, what I'm trying to do is give information through online presence and through publications to the deaf community in Korea. I want to spread linguistic knowledge and disseminate information about the deaf culture. We have another timeline here from 2008, uh, working on the Korean Sign Language Law. Before, remember I said I was in uh, at the Max Planck Institute and I had been working there and one of my colleagues was from Turkey. His name is Hassan. And he went back to Turkey and worked on promoting or getting a sign language law there. We didn't have anything like that in Korea. And I said, well, that, you what? I said, you really Im impacted the community by doing that. So when I went back to Korea, I started discussing with people at the Korean Association of the Deaf and we decided that we should do something similar. So we had many, many discussions on that. We proposed it to the government, but they didn't accept it. So we had to wait a while. And then in 2012, the, one of the presidential candidates, Park Geun-hye, um, was running for president. <coughs> and uh, she invited the Deaf Association to come and meet and talk about issues. And we told them if we told about we told her about the importance of having a law to protect and develop Korean Sign Language, and in 2013 she did become president. So um, she had to fulfill her promise, and we worked hard to to develop the the draft proposal. In 2015, we were working on the the corpus of Korean Sign Language, and all of these points together brought us to 2016 when we were able to pass the Korean Sign Language Law. And in 2021, just very, very recently, February 3rd, they declared the, the all of Korea has declared a Korean Sign Language Day. And here you have the little meme who is showing, you see the one with Naver, which is a very famous Korean platform. And all of the uh, deaf people are very proud of that. And all of these relationships work together to bring that happening. Now, in 2023, we're going to be hosting the World Federation of the Deaf in, uh, in Jeju. So what happened was in 2019 was the last Congress of the World Federation of the Deaf and uh, Korea had bid to host it in the next four year event. And we made a presentation there and we we're very, very excited about the fact that all of the deaf, the deaf people that attended the World Federation of the Deaf in Paris then voted to support us to be the hosts in 2018. Uh, sorry, in two So we have that Korean sign language law from 2016, but before that, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the background. From 2006, we had the National Certification of Interpreters. There are quite a few people. We have there, as you see, 1,817 people who've been certified. And there are deaf people. There are deaf interpreters, 784. That's quite a lot. That's actually quite a lot. And this is a national certification. Now, also we have the Ministry of Health and Welfare, which is funding, uh, putting in a lot of money into the interpreting services network. And this has created a, an excellent network. Um, we have 220 centers throughout the country. And in each center, there are at least five people. There's a uh, deaf director, a, three interpreters and a deaf interpreter, at least this many people. So the services are developing quite a lot. Um, also, we have in the last few years, we've had several, we've had three major books printed on Korean sign language. Um, you can look in the references there for the references to those books. So this sign language community, the sign language research community and the deaf community, there are 
a lot of sharing, there's a lot of relationship going on between them. For example, we have the uh, Corpus project that we've been working on, but we also have strong support from the uh, deaf community for that Corpus project. There's a woman whose name is Eun Yong Lee, and she's a very famous deaf TV personality. And she does a lot to encourage deaf people to come and join and volunteer to give data and to be involved in the, the Corpus project. So that's a very important uh, aspect of the relationship between the deaf community and the research community. And also in Denmark, there is this very special project. It's called the Front Runners for Deaf Leaders. And several uh, deaf women, have, several deaf Korean women have been involved in there. There are six women who've gone to that project, each of them for one year. They come back to Korea and encourage the deaf community and they're, they're working as leaders and uh, have different kinds of jobs. And um, also Hong Song Eun, who finished her PhD in Germany, uh, is now back in Korea. And she's also very, very involved in the all kinds of research projects and with the deaf community. So, you know, we, as I've mentioned before, we have the Korean Sign Language Act that was passed in 2016. And Korean Sign Language now has equal status. And um, so what we have is the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, which is in charge of these projects. And they, whenever there's a project, they have a designated director of the projects and they do, they're supporting sign language research, um, classes, dictionary project and the corpus project, which were already in existence. So we've passed the Korean sign language law and now the emphasis, they've been focused previously on interpreters and what people are focusing on now is developing teachers of sign language. There are a lot of different programs to teach sign language. Um, and also universities are uh, developing sign language teaching uh, departments. So after the passage of the Korean Sign Language Law, the department, the ministry, the government, uh, set up something which is, well, they have the National Institute of Korean Language. And there is a special a department for special languages within that uh, National Institute. And on there, we have a board, we have a mention, we have a CODA person who knows sign. Um, but the deaf people who are on the board have difficulty communicating because there are some hearing people there who don't know sign language. Um, so it is a little bit limited. We have deaf, yes, we have deaf there, but we don't have real power to influence the decisions on the board. So uh, after the passage of the Korean Sign Language Law, we have both positive and negative things. Now in the positive side, the deaf community is very, very proud. And um, there is more funding given to sign language research. And the deaf are very happy that there are more opportunities to discuss Korean sign language. And then, as I said, right, you know, we've just had uh, the National Sign Language Day declared. And that's something that everybody's very proud of. But on the negative side, we do have some negative views from the deaf community. The control of everything is from the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism. But they don't know that much about sign language. They don't know, they really know nothing about sign language linguistics. They don't have an understanding of the deaf culture. And then what is sign language? What is sign language? Is it a kind of signed Korean or is it a natural sign language? So there is some conflict between all of these uh, different, diff different people's, different stakeholders' perspectives. 
right? So, and some people don't really have a, a linguistic perspective on that. And um, the other thing is the deaf people are not having much opportunity to contribute to the sign language research. And basically people see there's not that much change to the life of the deaf. Right now we're in the year 2021 and looking ahead to the year 2023, we're going to, we have a lot of positive hopes for the future in relation to the WFD coming here. Also, um, I hope to be finished with my PhD. I've been working in linguistics all this time and I've been working with the deaf community, but um, sometimes I have difficulty of convincing people of what my opinions are. And um, I want to be able to bring my credential of a PhD to bear on these conversations so that we can have more fruitful conversations and I will have more power, more respect by, by having that PhD. I'll be able to convince people more. Right. Now in the interpreter certification process, we also have a problem that the signed Korean is respected more than the uh, natural signing because we have people who do not have a linguistic background. Now about World of Federation of the Deaf. Again, Korea was in a state of oblivion and now that we are going to be the hosts of the world and all of these people are going to be coming here, the Koreans are also, the Korean deaf are getting very, very excited. And uh, we hope to see a new wave where we will have new encounters and the World Federation of the Deaf is going to recognize the, the power, the strength, the authenticity and the experiments, the power of the Korean, Feder uh, Korean Association of the Deaf. And it's going to be a chance for we Koreans to strengthen our relationships with the World Federation of the Deaf and with other deaf leaders. That's what we're hoping. In addition to uh, learning more about deaf rights and other aspects of deaf culture around the world. You see that picture, this is 2019 in Paris when uh, Korea was selected to host the World Federation of the Deaf in 2019. This is the moment when Korea accepted the award in and to be hosting the World Federation of the Deaf in Jeju. So the story that we've told about Korea for the past 20 years, it's not a story that has been written it's a story that came from a variety of encounters, from those serendipitous encounters. And that is what has created the evolution and the development of the Korean Sign Language story. So now we are getting ready to plan for the coming of World Federation of the Deaf to Korea. And we hope to see all of you, it's going to be in Jeju Island. And we want to welcome you to Korea. <laughs>